All right, I'd like to get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining this webinar to learn more about land use planning for wildfire resilience. My name is Logan Stan. I'm a recovery and resilience planner at the Colorado Department of Local Affairs in the Division of Local Government. This is the third webinar in the Planning for Hazards webinar series. Um, we're going to be having a couple more this year, so stay tuned for future events. Um, we'll notify you. And um, today's webinar will be recorded, and it will also be posted to the Planning for Hazards website. Just a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions, um, please write them down in the bottom right-hand corner of the chat box, and we will get to them at the end of the webinar. But before we get started, I just first want to say thanks to all our partners down at the bottom of the screen that helped us put this webinar together today. So today I am joined by Molly Maori, who is the founder and president of Wildfire uh, Planning International. And I'm also joined by Jim Knut, who is the community development director for Summit County. You'll hear more about their stories here in just a few minutes. Just a quick overview of the presentation. I'm going to set the stage and do a little bit of an introdu intro introduction, and then um, provide a bit of an overview for the planning for hazards Land Use Solutions for Colorado website and guide, and then um, really dive into, we'll move into diving into the land use policies and strategies, and um, then get to our Colorado case study with Summit County, and then we'll save some time at the end uh, for some questions and answers. So why is the topic of land use planning for wildfire resilience so important? Well, sort of setting the stage here, Currently, Colorado is growing and it has a population of about 5.5 million people, but it's projected to grow to about 8.6 by 2050. So how we continue to grow will really shape the long-term economic, social, and environmental health, as well as, the, as well as the viability of Colorado and its communities. Colorado is prone to hazards and disasters. Since 2010, wildfires and floods alone have destroyed more than 3,000 homes caused over $5 billion in impact and sent a ripple effect across Colorado's communities. Colorado experiences dozens of floods and anywhere between 2,400 to 4,000 wildfire events annually. But it's not really just floods and fires that we can focus on. There are a lot of other natural hazards as well as um, stresses that increase vulnerability to, to uh, communities across the state. But every community in Colorado does face vulnerabilities, whether they're natural or man-made. Um, vulnerability can really be measured in terms of a community's ability to anticipate and cope with certain shocks and stresses, whether that's to a particular acute natural hazard event or underlying stressors like high unemployment rates and poor access to education. What's important, though, to pull, take away from this is that as Colorado continues to grow, strategic and proactive integration of wildfire resilience and, and into land use planning tools and strategies will really help build community resilience by minimizing or avoiding exposure while at the same time reducing risk. But we need to think about how we approach wildfire holistically um, and wildfire risk holistically, not just in terms of what it means for life and property, but other elements of what makes our community fabric so vibrant, like our watersheds and air quality. Um, so this webinar is really going to focus on how local governments and communities in Colorado can use land use planning to reduce risk and vulnerability to wildfire while at the same time build resilient, resilient communities. So really quick, I just wanted to uh, show this map. And this is a map of our projected growth by counties and it's provided by um, the State of Colorado's Demography Office. Darkest red and the darker shades of red, um, I should say the darkest shade of red um, shows Colorado communities or counties in Colorado uh, that are going to have a population increase of greater than 60,000 people by 2050. The fastest growth in Colorado is going to take place between now and about 2025. Um, and again, we're going to probably have another 3 million plus people um, add to the state, which is a, an incredible amount of growth um, as we look out into the future. Second, um, growth is going to occur on both sides of the continental divide. It's not just on the east. It's not just on the east uh, slope and the front range communities, but also on the west slope. So um, this really just means that we all need to think about different implications for hazards and the different types of environments that they pose risk to. Uh, if you look at counties like Eagle County or Garfield, and they say, you know, they might be more forested communities um, and have a different relationship with their hazards versus 
um, a county like Elbert County out <clears throat> on the Eastern Front Range, it's more of a plains and agricultural community <clears throat> that has its own set of um, constraints and vulnerabilities. <clears throat> So wildfire, <coughs> excuse me, Colorado has more than 2.4 million acres of forest land, which provides a tremendous amount of <coughs> social, economic, and ecological benefits and value across the state. However, it's really important as we approach this topic to understand that wildfire is also a natural and critical part of what we constitute forest ecology and our watershed health. For example, if you look at wildfires, wildfires bring benefits like the recycling of nutrients, um, improved soil chemistry, increased food sources for fish and streams, um, and the replenishment of stream streamside vegetation, while at the same time watersheds are incredibly important because they provide critical flood control um, measures and, um, and critical water filtration. So the wildland urban interface, as we call the WUI, refers to the area where houses meet or intermingle uh, with undeveloped wildland vegetation. Currently in Colorado, there are about there are more than two million people who live within the wildland urban interface and that number is expected to increase, especially if you look back at the map at those counties and um, see where that growth is going to occur. Um, this means right now, currently, we have about a third of the population that is uh, facing wildfire risk. And that's a pretty staggering sort of statistic. Um, hazard, other hazards can also contribute to the potential for wildfires or it can actually influence wildfire behaviors. If you look at um, hazard threats like high winds which can power down lines, they can also produce rapid rates of spread of um, the active fires and increase the distance of what we call ember transport. Other hazards like floods and landslides and avalanches can leave um, resulting debris flows that have that increase heavy fuel loading. Um, lightning as we know ignites fuels but conversely, if you think about what does wildfire do, well, down trees um, from wildfires create dangerous debris loading that also increases flood vulnerability and the potential impacts uh, to water quality. If you look at the 2013 floods, it wasn't just the quantity of water that came down out of the mountains, but it was the content, um, the debris that came down and blew out culverts and um, really had a, had a tremendous effect on infrastructure. And then similarly, if we look at drought conditions, which are going to increase wildfire by um, decreasing fuel moisture. So, as this map is just a quick shot at um, the Denver metro area and wildfire risk as um, projected by the Colorado Wildfire Risk Assessment Portal, which is um, from the Colorado State Forest Service. Um, Actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to this last slide here. I think I missed a couple pieces of information. Um, yes, sorry about that. Um, my apologies. Uh, I wanted to continue. So wildfire is also getting bigger. Um, the Colorado State Forest Service uh, has a map down at the bottom, just a quick figure to show that uh, over 100,000 acres are burned each year. This is increasing on a decade, uh, per decade basis. Wildfires also burning at a higher temperature and at higher altitudes. Um, but I think what's also important here to note is wildfire seasons are lasting longer. Historically in Colorado, um, we've defined the fire season as May to September, but increasingly we're seeing high winds, or sorry, high, uh, we're seeing fires in the late fall and also winter, winter under periods of unusual heat and dryness. Um, but what does this mean for individual communities? Well, we think about it on a, on, a, on a basis of money and finances. Costs are going up, not just for suppression, but in terms of, um, but for insurance in terms of losses and also premiums um, to insure your homes. As of 2015, Colorado had, a, Colorado had nearly 100,000 homes that are either at high or very high risk of wildfire, which when you translate that is $28 billion of residential assets that are actually exposed to potential future wildfire damage. And for a case study, if you look at the 2013 Black Forest fire, um, the cost was over $9 million just to suppress the fire itself, and the insurance losses exceeded over $420 million. Um, climate is really a big deal here. Um, we're going to see, we're kind of, we are projecting 2.5 to 6.5 degrees increase by 2050. Um, this is going to have what we call a fourth multiplier effect. It's really going to increase the severity and the interplay between different hazards and 
um, especially as it relates to wildfire and what that's going to do for communities, really needs to be in consideration. consideration. So simply put, wildfire season has lengthened due to not just the climate, uh, change, climate change, um, but it's also resulting in wildfires that start earlier, last longer. We're seeing higher costs and it costs more to suppress fires. Um, and it's also inflicting more damage to the natural built environment while threatening lives across Colorado. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide because uh, I just mentioned it, but um, this is the wildland urban interface in the Denver metro metropolitan area. This is as it is right now. Um, and we're going to probably see this type of image increase in its color index um, in the next couple of years. <coughs> so implications for Colorado. Um, Colorado's growth and climate trends are really going to require communities to use intelligent, uh, think about land use planning in, a sort of, in an intelligent manner. Um, when we think about a planning for hazards approach, the best way for communities to to maintain safety and resilience is to avoid hazards altogether. But we know that's not always possible because there's conflicts of interest, um, political will. Um, this is just one approach. If you can avoid development in hazard-prone areas, um, that is the best um, solution for planning for hazards. But we also have a couple other approaches that we can consider, such as preventing development in hazardous areas. Communities can discourage or restrict development in vulnerable areas like the WUI or other hazardous areas um, and can do this through a combination of regulatory approaches like an overlay zone or through incentive programs like cluster subdivisions, but also through non-regulatory approaches. Um, if we think about directing growth to safer areas, communities can also encourage growth in locations that are less vulnerable to natural hazards. Directing future growth requires that the community um, can identify locations that are essentially deemed suitable for uh, development or redevelopment and can do this through a visioning process or a long-range plan like the comprehensive plan. But once a safe area has been identified, communities can back up those policy decisions by directing investments such as a uh, capital improvements program and removing barriers to developing those areas. <clears throat> but not to be overshadowed, we have a lot of existing development and communities that are in um, areas that are exposed to hazards. So avoiding hazard areas um, in, in areas that are actually more developed is, is, is an important thing to consider. Many land use and mitigation strategies do exist, um, such as uh, upgrading development standards to protect vulnerable areas or looking at like uh, stronger floodplain regulations, for example, or um, updating building codes for both promote safer development, um, and in some cases, relocating existing structures. So in the wake of the 2012-2013 floods and fires in Colorado, the Department of Local Affairs, along with other state agencies, FEMA, local governments, and uh, technical subject matter experts developed the Planning for Hazards uh, Land Use Solutions for Colorado guide and website. And really, the guide is designed to provide land use planning tools and strategies that communities can use to reduce risk um, that are at their disposal, that are in their planning framework um, for each community. So a quick outline, this is how the guide um, is structured. It, the planning framework really sets up the foundation for why would you consider land use planning for hazards, and what are the approaches that are available for um, people to take. And then it, goes to a uh, hazard identification and risk assessment section and a chapter that really provides a how-to guide for preparing a risk assessment um, that is critical to understanding communities' risk um, and how different risks might affect your particular community. But the real meat of the guide and the resource is in the planning tools and strategies. Here are several categories of specific land use planning tools and strategies um, that can be explored that all include individual profiles for what each tool can do and describe the hazards that they address, how to use the tool, which communities they've already been implemented in, which is an important um, function of the site, is really to hear those stories and read those stories and see where are people actually doing this across Colorado. Uh, for many of the tools and strategies, there's also model code language that um, anybody can take and apply to their jurisdiction and um, essentially tailor to their specific needs. 
So really quickly, this is just the interface of the guide. Uh, it's the planningforhazards.com website. I strongly encourage folks to go visit it when you have a few minutes. You can download the guide itself, sections of the guide, um, and explore all the different tools, model codes, um, lots of good information, case studies that are in here. Um, again, I strongly encourage and hope everyone has a chance to check it out at some point. And just really quickly, um, the hazards that this guide does address are here in that lineup. I'm not going to go through each one of them, but um, we are constantly, this is an iterative document, an iterative resource that we're going to continue to, to explore. So, no, I'm getting short on time here, but um, there are 25 land use tools and strategies that are in the guide. Of that 25, um, there are only three that do not explicitly address wildfire. And these plan, these tools are broken into um, addressing hazards and plans and policies, so looking at your comprehensive plan or your uh, natural hazard mitigation plan in the category of strengthening incentives, protecting sensitive areas, improving site development standards, um, looking at improving buildings and infrastructure, as well as enhancing administra administration procedures. But I can't break this all down um, here. I just strongly encourage people to go check it out. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Molly. Oh, one more slide, sorry. Uh, and this is just really quickly a, a shot of the subdivisions and site design standards. If you were to look at this particular tool on the website, um, you can see where it's been done. Look at the model commentary and model code and the commentary that exists for this um, this tool, and then see the different types of hazards that it addresses. So, it's very user friendly and easy to understand. I um, hope everyone has a chance to look, take a chance to take, have a chance to look at it at some point. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to Molly. Molly, are you there with us? Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Yep, perfect. Great. Okay. And it looks like I can go ahead and advance the slides. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Logan. And again, my name is Molly Mowry. I am a certified land use planner, and I've been specialized in this wildfire planning topic for the last 10 years. I manage a consulting firm, Wildfire Planning International, based here in Littleton, Colorado but we get to work with communities across the state and the country and to some extent Canada, hence the international part of the campaign. So I wanted to start out today just by framing the wildfire topic a little bit more with respect to planning. So there's this common narrative that I'm sure many of you are familiar with that often talks about how today's wildfire problems are a result of decades of fire suppression and misguided forest management practices. But from my perspective, that's really only half of the story. So for centuries, you know, really since this country was founded, we have allowed, and in some cases encouraged people to build their towns and cities and homes in wildfire prone areas without any forethought to what happens if a wildfire were to occur. So we've enabled these built environments to stretch across natural wildfire prone environments and in doing so we've created what we now call the wildland urban interface or the WUI as uh, Logan already introduced. So this is a challenge that's going to take some time to course correct. You know it's centuries in the making but the good news of course is why we're on the webinar today is that there are land use planning tools to help address this. One of the things that's really essential to understand about the WUI, though, is that it's based on a set of local conditions. So, for example, the, veget the vegetation types, or what we call fuels, topography, weather, density of structures, you know, some of these things you'll, you'll take note that we can change, and other things we can't change. But the point is that a community's WUI may look very different depending on your location. One of my colleagues even calls this the PUI, <laughs> so for the Prairie Urban Interface. Uh, so we have some jokes about these WUIs and PUIs. Um, but you know, because of this, because of these local conditions, WUIs are often identified best at the local or state level by experts in hazard mapping and fire risk modeling. So for the purposes of today's discussion on WUI planning tools, I'm not going to get into how WUIs are identified and assessed. That really could be its own webinar topic. But it is important to keep in mind that the practice and implementation of these WUI planning tools is best done with locally driven data 
and assumes that a community really understands where and how its WUI is defined. The planning for hazards guide does talk in much more detail about the hazard identification and risk assessment process. But the important message here is really that WUIs are dynamic, they're diverse, and of course they are challenging. So one of the programs that my company is engaged in implementing is a national a program called the Community Planning Assistance for Wildfire, or CPAW program. <clears throat> and we work in partnership with a nonprofit called Headwaters Economics to offer free technical WUI planning services to communities. This is grant funded by the Forest Service and other private foundations to allow us to offer this service. And to date, we've worked with about 18 communities across the country. So we get to spend a lot of time in different WUIs and PUIs <laughs> talking with planning departments and fire departments about what their WUIs look like. And we typically start out our, our planning process by showing this graphic. And this graphic highlights a few of the many WUI planning tools in our arsenal, such as landscaping regulations, building codes, subdivision design standards, land development codes. You know, it really helps broaden the thinking around how many tools we actually have to address this topic, as Logan pointed out in one of his previous slides on how many planning tools the Planning for Hazards Guide addresses. <clears throat> so it also helps to convey our primary planning objective. Why do we care about working in the WUI? What is the point of this? And this slide shows that you know, our objective is to reduce risk to the built environment and the natural environment so that wildfires can occur on the landscape without becoming a disaster. So we know they're going to happen, but we need to understand how we can live better with wildfire. And in working with many of these different communities in their WUI, there's, there are many tools that come up, but there's three general ones that I wanted to talk about because we consistently find ourselves talking about them. So I wanted to highlight them on this webinar. The comprehensive plan, the WUI code, which we'll get into is because that means many different things, and the community wildfire protection plan. So the first, and many of you, I'm sure, have heard of these tools, but um, hopefully I can offer some tips and different ways to think about using them. So, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting over a cold, so it's a, and it's prime allergy season, so I'm kind of in the midst of that right now. Uh, the first tool is the comp plan. And I think this is one of the most overlooked tools from my perspective, because it's really one of the most essential building blocks for good WUI planning. But it's surprising how many communities don't actually address wildfire in their comp plan. So for an example, we worked with the city of Wenatchee, Washington last year through the CPAW program. And they actually already had amazing buoy regulations in place. But ironically, wildfire was largely absent from their comp plan, which was called the Wenatchee Urban Area Plan. And so, since that plan had been last updated in 2006, a number of wildfires have occurred that have affected their city and region, uh, including wildfire home losses, or home losses and commercial losses due to wildfire. So the timing was really perfect for us to make recommendations to include wildfire in their plan update. And since our recommendations, the city has gone ahead and incorporated wildfire into their natural environment element. And this includes background on wildfire, a new draft goal to acknowledge the impacts that wildfires have on the Wenatchee Valley, um, and many others that you know, seek to develop and implement approaches to help the community adapt to the risks of wildfire. So it, you know, in this case, it's not just about bad wildfires, though. <laughs> it's about bad wildfires, if you will, and I'm putting that in quotes, um, but also the benefits of wildland fires and their important ecological role in the landscape. So you want to look at policies as you know, looking at the potential impacts that unwanted, uncontrolled wildfires can have on your community, but also what's the role that the good, the wild land fires serve on the landscape, and kind of acknowledging this overall relationship that your community has with this particular hazard. So another quick example is with the city of Flagstaff, which along these lines does have um, forestry and wildfire related policies in their comp plan for a number of years. And the city has used these policies to justify the city council when they need to do continued work in the WUI. So they can stand up and say, hey, look, this is in our comp plan. 
we need to be consistent with our comp plan and it's important for us to you know continue the work that we're doing in the WUI. So a final note on this is that you can integrate these policies in one element or you can disperse it throughout your comp plan, you know, whatever works best for you. But think holistically about wildfires, good and bad, and how they affect your community. So similar to any other disaster, the effects can be very far-reaching and it's often well beyond public safety. So while public safety and evacuation is important, you know, policies should extend beyond that into other resilient topics. So, you know, how, how, how resilient is our housing stock to wildfires, for example? So the next uh, tool here is the WUI code. And I put the WUI code in quotes because, as I mentioned before, this is a very large category, and I want to break it down a little bit more to help you think about it. You know, when communities come to us and they say, we want a WUI code, we actually have to determine what they really mean by that. You know, so first we start talking about what is it that you want to address. So there are many different facets of the WUI that can be addressed through a regulatory process. Um, I listed some here, and, and many of these are addressed in the uh, Planning for Hazards Guide. So for example, building construction and materials, the roofs, the vents, the siding, the windows, uh, that could be addressed through, quote, a WUI code. Siting, where do you want the structure to be on the property, or where do you want the subdivision to be? Uh, fuels and vegetation, uh, fuels that is vegetation. You know, what's the type and the amount and the location? Another way, though, to think about fuels, which we do, is that housing is fuels, for example. So you know, where are you putting things that can burn in relation to uh, wildfire-prone areas? Access is another one. This is a more common topic. You know, what's the width and grade of a driveway or a road? How many points of access do you want within a subdivision? Um, and then there's many other fire protection standards that relate to all of this. Uh, finally, we also talk about what's the kind of use that you want to allow in an area. Is the use um, full of combustible materials, for instance, like a warehouse or something like that? So, you know, it's first essential to, to, to determine what your community actually wants to regulate. And then that's when we recommend the appropriate pathway. So, Communities can adopt a standalone WUI code, and there's models for this. One of them is the International Code Council's, it's called the International WUI Code. And many communities adopt this with or without local amendments. You know, they may say, yes, I want this piece, but I'm not, I'm just going to create an exemption for this, or we're not going to do vegetation in this chapter, for instance. Other models out there are the NFPAs, the National Fire Protection Association set of standards. So those are good also to refer to to know, okay, well, this is the standard that we will use when we regulate through our code. So that process could be a standalone ordinance or code or a set of regulations that get adopted. Um, but many of these regulations can also be addressed through existing channels. So for instance, you don't have to adopt a WUI code. You could look at your subdivision standards and say, we're going to put a WUI section within our, our um, subdivision standards because we're already addressing access, we're already addressing subdivision siting, and you know the requirement for vegetation management, et cetera. Similarly, you could do this with zoning codes, and you can look at the types of uh, you know, attachments and landscaping that are allowed in the development section. Um, a building code is another one. So you can see that this can take many shapes or forms the key point is to understand what it is that needs to be regulated and then find the appropriate pathway. So this tool has a tremendous amount of flexibility and variability. It does, however, require you have a defendable process for determining the WUI. And it goes back to you know, the topic we're not getting into today because it's quite detailed in and of itself. But you know, what communities need to know is where the risk is or where the hazard is and then where the regulations will apply. So often communities will create an overlay zone and then they'll conduct a site assessment to verify the local conditions, which is the next point of this slide here. <clears throat> so when we work with communities, we encourage them to incorporate site-specific assessments into their regulatory process for that very purpose, to confirm the proper siting of a new development or the structure and work with other considerations such as preserving a view shed, for instance. So you, you're making this, um, this compatibility occur between 
what you may have designated as a broad overlay zone of the WUI to the actual local conditions, because as we talked about before, it's really the local conditions that drive the risk on the ground. So we need to know, you know, what is it that we want to look at once someone goes out there? <clears throat> and then this really acts as a safety valve for confirming the accuracy of the map. You know, no map is perfect, so it adds some flexibility and reassurance to the process. Um, it does require, though, a professional forester or a mitigation specialist or a planner with the appropriate expertise. You know, some examples that I know are mentioned in the guide or they're just examples I want to share, Colorado-specific, uh, Larimer County, Douglas County, Boulder County, Eagle County, the city of Colorado Springs. There's a number of really great community uh, examples out there locally that I would encourage you to look at, and I'm sure Many of you on the webinar today have your own examples, so you know, please feel, feel free to provide that in the chat box as we go along here. And then the final uh, tool to mention is the Community Wildfire Protection Plan, CWPP. Again, this is likely something you're familiar with, but I really want to underscore the value of the CWPP in the process. So this is another non-regulatory tool, but we know that WUI planning doesn't happen in a vacuum. So there's a number of other activities that planning you know, may relate to, but planners aren't necessarily going to go out and do them. Um, education and outreach, for example, or fuel treatments on the ground. So the CWPP is that document that holds all of this together. And you know, we refer to it as the glue in the wildfire planning process. It's also where the WUI risk hazard map or the risk map gets maintained and, and stores. It's kind of this collector of all this good information, including links to the comprehensive plan where hopefully your policies and um, you know, future activities are, are mentioned, including something like where's the wildfire risk map in relation to the future land use map? You know, how do those two talk to each other? and that the CWPP is, is a good link. Um, I also wanted to put in a plug here for FEMA because they've been doing a lot of good work on linking the CWPP to the local hazard mitigation plan. So if anyone's here from FEMA and wants to share, I think FEMA Region 10 is giving actually a coffee break webinar series coming up later this week on exactly this integration between CWPPs and natural hazard mitigation plans. So, so please feel free to add that info into the webinar chat box too. But the point is the CWPP is again sometimes overlooked as a planning tool, but there's a lot of opportunity for it for planners to engage, and it's also a good capacity building mechanism. So I know that Jim's going to talk a little bit more about that in the Summit County example, and um, I won't really spend any more time on it here since I think he has a good, good example to share. <clears throat> so just a quick couple resources that I mentioned throughout this uh, part of the talk. The CPAW, Community Planning Assistance for Webinar Program, is there's a number of different local examples on the, our website, planningforwildfire.org. You know, you can look at specifically the, the number of recommendations that we've given to communities and where there's an appropriate update on, you know, what people are doing. We've tried to include that too, so the where we work. And then, you know, if you know of a community that's interested in this opportunity, please feel free to, to share it with them. It's a really unique, um, unique assistance that you know you can't really get at, at no charge in any other way. So I encourage you to share that. And then the other final resource is coming up at the Western Planner uh, Conference in Spearfish, South Dakota in September. We're doing a pre-conference WUI training. It's just one day on September 12th. So that's just the day before the conference starts. And a couple other FEMA resources. So a few colleagues and myself finished updated, updating recently or creating a new series of uh, courses. They're two-day courses each on WUI land use planning, adopting WUI regulations, and WUI evacuation planning. So if you want to do a deeper dive into this uh, topic, I would encourage you to, Logan provided the links here. There aren't any uh, course is actually scheduled yet, but um, if you click on the FEMA link, you can stay up to date on when these are next available. So thanks so much for the time. I'm going to hand it over to 
Jim. And um, if you have any questions in the chat room, please let me know, or here's my contact information too. All right. Well, thank you, Molly. Um, I want to be sure my audio is working. So can you hear me? Loud and clear. OK, great. Uh, well, um, Logan and Molly asked me to talk about some of the things we're doing up here in Summit County uh, and some of the tools and strategies that we're using to improve our wildfire resilience and lessen our overall wildfire risk. Um, so let me get to my cursor here. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Summit County, we're located just west of the Continental Divide. So when you're heading west on I-70 and you come out of the tunnel, you're in Summit County. I showed this picture here. This is from Mount Royal looking back east toward the Continental Divide uh, at over the town of Frisco. And I just wanted to show uh, Dillon Reservoir, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Uh, this reservoir is Denver Water's largest source of water storage. And so they're very concerned about our wildfire risk. And they've been contributing lots of money, millions of dollars over the years to the US Forest Service to help them with their fuel reduction efforts. Um, about 80% of Summit County is national forest land, which is great, except for the fact that in the early 2000s, the pine beetles swept through here and uh, really wreaked havoc on our lodgepole pine forest, predominantly lodgepole pine. Um, so that really uh, caused great concern for the citizens of Summit County. Uh, many people don't think that we're very susceptible to wildfires here in the county due to our high elevation, but we get several fires every year. They're usually very small, unattended campfires or lightning strikes, uh, those sorts of things. We're able to get on them pretty quickly, but we did have a, a several hundred acre fire in the northern part of our county just about two years ago. Um, and here, just a couple of photos happen to have. Uh, the photo on the left is a fire near Keystone Ski Resort very recently. That was about 16 acres. That happened about seven years ago. And uh, on the right was a fire that came down approaching our high school, that red brick building that you see there. We had several hundred of our children in that building when this fire was starting to make its way down the hill. Uh, the green building that you see over on the other side of the uh, slide there is a sewer plant that services the whole Upper Blue Basin, including the town of Breckenridge. So there's a, an example of some critical infrastructure at risk due to wildfire. So we take it pretty seriously. Uh, earlier in the presentation, Logan mentioned, and so did Molly, the uh, Planning for Hazards Guide that DOLA has put out. Uh, I strongly suggest you go check that out on their website. It's got lots of uh, great resources for communities dealing with all sorts of natural hazards, including wildfire. And uh, Logan put up a, a rather extensive list of recommendations that are on that guide that communities can use uh, in dealing with wildfire. Um, Summit County is utilizing many of those. Uh, I think that's why they asked me to be uh, the case study to, to talk to you here today. Um, and I'm just going to kind of briefly go through those in the next 15 minutes or so. I, we might be running a few minutes late, so I'll try and talk really quickly. Uh, I've broken some of our tools and strategies out into four boxes here. That upper block uh, box is kind of our planning efforts to prepare for wildfire issues and reduce our wildfire risk. Uh, the middle right-hand box are some of our land preservation strategies that encourage density to end up you know, not being located in the high risk areas of the county. Uh, the middle box on the left are some of our rules and regulations, our, our, our regulations and standards that we utilize to deal with wildfire issues. And the box at the bottom are just some other um, uh, strategies that we employ uh, to deal with wildfire. So we'll start with that top box and all of our master plans. We certainly have lots of plans in Summit County. We like to do our planning work. Um, you know, planning allows you to analyze your baseline conditions and lay out your game plan for how you want to move the needle. Um, so I strongly suggest that you do the planning work up front and you identify uh, what it is you're, you're trying to do and how to do it and, uh, and include wildfire risk reduction strategies in your various master plans. The only one of these plans that I really want to call any attention to in any more detail is our CWPP. Molly mentioned community wildfire protection plans. 
I'm sure many of you have CWPPs. If you don't, I strongly suggest you consider creating one. Uh, we created ours in 2006 after doing extensive base mapping uh, of, our, of our existing conditions. So we looked at vegetation types and slope and topography and aspect, fire response zones, um, locations of developed and dispersed camping areas, lightning strike data, location of our essential infrastructure like homes and businesses and hospitals and power lines uh, and just other community values at risk. We looked at local preparedness uh, firefighting capabilities, locations of fire stations and roads and water sources. Um, so when you overlay all that information, we ended up coming up with these 27 focus areas. And that really helps us focus our, our time and money and efforts into the areas that, uh, you know, kind of came out through that overlay effort to really say this is where you should be spending most of your fuel reduction and other uh, actions to reduce your uh, overall wildfire risk. So kind of back to the box, here we're going to talk about some land preservation strategies. Uh, the first one there, land acquisition. We have a very robust open space acquisition program. Uh, funded by the Summit County voters. I'll get, I'll get into that a little bit later. But through buying up land, we've protected over about 10,000 acres of land in Summit County. And so that has the uh, offshoot effect of assuring that homes will not be built on that land in the future. So we tend to end up buying this property in the more re remote locations. We're not out buying up large tracts of uh, open space in the middle of towns and so on. So we're out there buying up old mining claims from the 1800s or other properties that likely will end up being developed if we didn't purchase them. So that's that many more homes, you know, not being built in the more wildfire prone areas. We also utilize conservation easements and have protected a couple thousand acres through conservation easements. And lastly, our TDR program, or our Transfer of Development Rights, um, is, has been a, a really great program. This photograph here just shows you uh, uh, the development pattern that might happen in the heavily wooded backcountry areas if we didn't have an open space acquisition program and utilize conservation easements. Our TDR program lets the property owner sell their development right to a developer that is most likely developing somewhere in the more urban areas, in a town or in some urban portion of the county, um, and get those houses out of the backcountry. Uh, through the development, or excuse me, through the TDR program, we've, we've moved about 100 development rights and have protected about 1,200 acres. So all told, uh, we've protected about 16,000 acres of land through those three programs that I mentioned. Uh, let's see, let me click on the next one. So uh, subdivision regs, uh, zoning regs, building codes, these are all of our regulatory ways that we go about dealing with wildfire issues. Um, let me uh, flip a page here. Before I jump into some examples of our codes, I, I did want to reiterate uh, something that Molly had mentioned, which is that CPAW program. I think that's a great program. We took advantage of that. We were the pilot program in the nation, I believe, to, to have that performed for us, to have that service performed for us. And this is uh, the front page of the document that we got. So Headwaters Economic, uh, Economics, Wildfire Planning International, Molly's Group, and uh, Clarion came into our community, read all of our master plans, our development code, and our CWPP, and then offered us this document, which included just dozens and dozens, well, really hundreds of recommendations on how we could bolster those documents uh, and really um, improve the way we go about protecting our, our community. So uh, I suggest you look into that and see if uh, that's a service that can be performed in your community. Um, if you're interested in reading the recommendations that were given to Summit County, this document is on the Headwaters Economics website. It's probably on Molly's as well in Clarion. It wouldn't surprise me, but uh, I know for sure it's on the Headwaters uh, thing. So with all those recommendations, we uh, went ahead and updated our CWPP just last year. 
It was the most significant update to the CWPP in 10 years since we first created it in 2006. And uh, we incorporated many of those recommendations and really uh, improved the quality of our document. Uh, we're currently in the process of updating our countywide comp plan and plan to incorporate many of the recommendations into that document. And we also have draft code language in our, for our development code uh, that we're hoping to uh, implement a number of those recommendations as well. So jumping into the text of our code, these are just a few examples. On the left is existing language in our code that deals with wildfire issues. And then on the right are some of the proposed recommendations, either through that came out of either through that CPAW effort or just our own knowledge of what we'd like to see happen. Um, and just for fun, most of the recommendations and most of the changes that we're going to put in our code are not very controversial and they're and I'm sure they're going to sail through just fine, but I, uh, I just pulled out a few that might, you know, get a reaction from some people, but you have to kind of be bold if you want to accomplish some things. So we are proposing, uh, if you look at that top one, 350517, to uh, prohibit uh, fencing material that is combustible within 10 feet of a structure. There has to be a five-foot section of non-combustible material to prevent a fence that might be on fire from being acting like a wick and, and leading the fire right to the home. We are going to prohibit combustible uh, mulching material around the house within five feet. And that bottom one is where we will prohibit you from storing your firewood pile uh, within zone one, the defensible space zone one. Um, so those might be uh, topics of significant discussion. And we'll see just how that turns out, but we are going to propose those sorts of things uh, as we move forward with our development code changes. Here in our subdivision regs, on the again on the left are some existing language. The only thing I'll point out is item D. I think that's interesting. So for all new subdivisions, you have to submit a forest management plan, and it will likely include some sort of uh, fuel reduction component and so we want to see people doing a substantial amount of fuel reduction work on a property early on at the subdivision stage. Um, over in, on the right side, under the proposed language, you can see that we're proposing to require subdividers to uh, design uh, the lots within that proposed subdivision to accommodate defensible space zones one and two in the size and shape of the lot. Uh, right off the bat, um, history has kind of shown that a lot of times under our current uh, building code requirements, which I'll get to here in a second, you are required to clear pretty much all, all fuels within 30 feet of the home. But in older subdivisions, you know, the house might sit 15 feet from the lot line, so they can't accomplish full zone one uh, protection, and so we're going to start to see if we can address that early on at the subdivision stage. Next slide is our building code. Again, Molly mentioned building code is, is a component of various WUI codes. Uh, chapter 45 of our building code does limit soffit venting to a certain maximum size, 1 16th of an inch, to prevent embers from getting up into the home and starting it on fire. We require sprinkling of any structure over 6,000 square feet. We require Class A non-combustible roofing material, so no more cedar shake shingles in Summit County anywhere ever again. Uh, you're welcome to have a metal roof or an asphalt roof or tile or slate or something that is much more fire resistant. Uh, and here's our defensible space requirements. Again, that's in our building code currently. We might move those over to our zoning and subdivision regs, but right now at building permit time, when you get a building permit, before you'll get a CO, you have to do mandatory defensible space. So you have to clear an area of 30 feet from the home, pretty much of all trees and shrubs and other flammable material. You know, there are some exceptions to be made. If you planted that tree on Father's Day with your children, I'm sure they, they won't make you cut that down. but. Uh, for the most part, you know, the goal is to clear the flammable material in close proximity to the home. So the last category that I wanted to talk about is some of the other things that we're doing. 
Uh, and I'll start with our Wildfire Council. This is a great group of people that get together every two months for the last 10 years, uh, starting in 2006. This group has come together and they talk all things wildfire. Their mission is to uh, implement the CWPP, and they do that any number of ways, including uh, managing our grant program that I'll talk about here in a second, by uh, managing our chipping program and our education efforts, our public education efforts. So it's a great group of folks who care about uh, lessening our wildfire risk here in Summit County. It's made up of the count representatives from the county, the towns within the county, the Forest Service, the State Forest Service, uh, our three local fire protection districts, and citizens as well. So, uh, yeah, great. If you don't have a, a wildfire council, you might want to consider something like that. Funding. We're fortunate enough to have money to throw at the uh, wildfire risk reduction efforts. Um, our voters in Summit County passed a referred measure many years ago that raises millions of dollars for a number of, of needed things like affordable housing and so on, but also wildfire protection. And we have about a half a million dollars every year to work with. We have a grant program, the first two items that you see there on the bullet list, a hazardous fuel reduction grant program and a CWPP grant program. Fuel reduction means, you know, cutting, cutting trees on your lot or in your homeowners association common areas. We'll match that 50-50 and help you pay for that work. Uh, our CWPP grant program are things that are non-fuel reduction, like if you're in a subdivision that isn't on central water and you may not have a, a source to put out a fire in your subdivision readily available, we'll help you pay for a cistern maybe to install in that subdivision or improve signage, street signage, that sort of thing. Uh, next one is our chipping program. Uh, well, actually, before I go to that, I wanted to point out that through those two grant programs, uh, we've contributed almost two and a half million dollars to these uh, to these efforts. But because of the uh, matching requirement and the leveraging, we have really put over five million dollars in the last ten years or twelve years toward our fuel our fuel reduction and other uh, wildfire hazard reduction efforts. Uh, chipping program. This has been really exciting program. Uh, next Monday, we're going to kick off our fourth year of the free chipper program. And the way this works is if a homeowner does some defensible space around their home or on their lot uh, and puts that woody material out by the road, either in logs or in other kinds of slash, you know, branches and that sort of thing, um, we will come by your property and we'll chip it and haul it away for free. Um, so free to the homeowner, uh, the program has cost us uh, this year, it's a little over $100,000 to run this chipping program. We hire a, a private tree contractor, tree service contractor every year. It's been different every year for the first three years that we've done it. And we will drive down every single street in Summit County twice throughout the summer and fall months and uh, we do extensive education. You see that sign. We have a whole bunch of signs that we put out in the neighborhood just the week before we, we show up and we say, are you re we're also on the radio saying, the chipper's coming to your neighborhood next week. Are you ready for us? And the homeowners get out there. I have lots of metrics on how many tons of, of woody material that we've taken out of uh, Summit County. Uh, we put that wood to beneficial use by uh, sending it to the biofuel plant in Gypsum or to Climax Mine for their environmental remediation work that they're doing up there. Uh, so lastly, the last thing that uh, we use our money for is edu public education. So we really get the word out uh, about the value of wildfire risk reduction and defensible space work. And we are on the radio and TV. Uh, Dan Schroeder, our CSU Extension agent, is in charge of all of our educational efforts on behalf of the Wildfire Council. We put ads on buses like you see here. We put up tables at Farmer's Market, and we really spread the word. We spend about twenty twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000 on just general wildfire risk reduction education every year. So that was a real quick summary of what we're doing here in Summit County. 
Uh, and like I said before, if you have any, if you want to delve into any of these things in greater detail afterward, even after that question and answer period, feel free to give me a call and we can talk about anything as long as you'd like. So I'll turn it back over to you, Logan. Excellent. Thanks, Jim. So this is a, this is a slide with everyone's contact information. Um, I'm going to go ahead and send this PDF to everybody. Once, um, once the presentation is over, so you'll have this information. Um, but at this point, I would like to open it up to any questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them down at the bottom right-hand corner in the chat box. Um, and while you're doing that, I will just note that Amanda from FEMA um, mentioned that there is a integrating community wildfire protections plans and natural hazards mitigation plans webinar this Friday from 10 to 11 Pacific Standard Time. Um, there's a link in the box there, so um, add that to your calendars if you have any interest. Um, and if there are any other questions, you can type those in. Uh, there was one from Waverly to Molly, in case people can't see the screen for whatever reason. Um, does adopting a standalone WUI code create a type of overlay zone that prompts developers to also look at the WUI code in addition to existing codes? How does one ensure that developers know which regulations to follow? And um, Molly's response to that was, yes, adopting a standalone WUI code or any WUI regulations does require uh, referencing other codes and regulations to ensure applicants know which codes apply when. For example, it should be clear when mitigation such as vegetation removal occurs in the development process, especially um, when potential conflicts could occur such as like tree preservation standards, often the WUI regulations supersede other regulations. So. And to answer your question, Miriam, yes, this uh, presentation is being recorded and I will send a link um, along with all the other resources as soon as the presentation is over today. Um, so people will have that there aren't any other questions, going once, going twice. All right, well, thank you very much, everybody, for um, tuning in today. And a special thanks to Molly and Jim for being able to um, present on this topic. They're absolute experts and incredibly knowledgeable um, in this realm and in all things land use planning. So um, if you have any thoughts after, please get a hold of any of us, and um, I'll send around our contact information pretty soon. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Logan. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.